extremely gracious to come and present the class. He presented also the, the previous one. And the, the purpose of these talks of people from the outside is to get a little deeper into certain aspects of optic oceanography. And he's staying here for lunch, so feel free to um, get as much of your expertise as you can. He's also the one who got us uh, Ule Pharrell oh. uh, <laughs> scale for the cruise. Uh, he might get into it in his talk. Did it work okay? <laughs> Not a lot of moving parts. <laughs> is this, uh, can you tell if it says it's on here? Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'm going to talk about coccolithophores in this class. And it's impossible to talk about the optical properties of coccolithophores without a little bit of background about their biogeochemistry. And uh, for this talk, I've, I've also done a bit of a review of the latest literature. And I'll be interjecting uh, some of the new things that I think are uh, really cool uh, in coccolithophore uh, biogeochemistry. And here we go. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the organisms themselves, their taxonomy, blooms, their physiology, who cares about them, uh, and their optical properties, this last section. So. Coccolithophores are amongst the group of marine planktonic calcifiers. They are not the only organisms in the sea that produce calcium carbonate, which is highly scattering, and which is why I'm here talking to you today. Uh, they're also foraminifera. These are uh, protozoa. They're pteropods, which are swimming mollusks. And uh, these guys produce aragonite. It's a different form of calcium carbonate, but it scatters light just like calcium carbonate. Um, uh, like calcite, which is what coccolithophores are made of. The calcite and the, these are aragonite, and these guys here are also aragonite. Foraminifera, uh, and you s notice the size differences 50 to 500 microns, they're much less abundant. And pteropods, 5 millimeters to a centimeter, and they're even less abundant. So there are very few of, of these large, giant calcium carbonate producing organisms in the sea, but in fact they can make a large amount of the sediments uh, over geological time. But I'm going to be focusing on these guys. They're 5 to 30 micrometers, they're plants, they're uh, unicellular. So one of the most important biocalcifiers in the ocean are the coccolithophores, and they're in a class called Primnesiophyce. Uh, and they, within that class, there's a family called haptophytes. Uh, and these haptophytes are the ones that produce these scales that are made of calcium carbonate. Uh, they're evolutionarily very young. Uh, the most common ones are only about 2 million years before present. They've gone through, through evolutionary time, they've gone through several bottlenecks, one being the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. Uh, and there's another one uh, after that where the populations basically were squeezed down to just a few species and then they re-radiated. Re so he, they come in various shapes and sizes. Uh, this guy here, Braurutosphera bigelowii, uh, just has these fa this fantastic shape. Uh, Rhabdosphera, these are quite common. Here's uh, Coccolithus pelagicus, and this one points out uh, that you can actually have a single species that has two different types of coccolis. Over the past probably two decades, uh, there have been major transformative discoveries about the life cycles of these particular plants. And uh, they have a haptophyte sa stage, which is basically a, a, a single uh, complement of chromosomes, or haploid, and a diploid stage, uh, which in this case is this guy with a big coccolis. And sometimes you're lucky enough to find them in the process of switching over. So, and here's the star of the show. Globally, this is the most uh, abundant one. This is called Ameliania huxleyi, and we'll talk more about that. It's found in virtually all uh, the world oceans. Uh, and here's another shot of these guys going through uh, their uh, life cycle changes. So as I said, they come in a wide variety of, of sizes and shapes. 
Uh, I think of them uh, it, it producing the oceanic dandruff of the sea. Uh, no matter where you go, you will find these coccoliths in the water. And because they're calcium carbonate and highly scattering, it doesn't take many of them to produce an optical signature. Now, there's some more important observations of coccolithophores uh, that go back in time here, and it's worth talking about. So it was this guy, Lohman, who uh, basically made the first conjecture that a major portion of the content of ocean sediments uh, is uh, from coccoliths and coccolithophorids. And then the first observations of blooms, the very first observation was by a guy named Garter in 1938. And I, uh, he was working in Norway. Browrud, who's a famous name and whose name appears on some coccolithophore species, uh, found a bloom, again, uh, in a fjord. Uh, Browrud had a second pub in 1945. And he was, uh, again, looking at Oslo, uh, a fjord in Oslo. And yet another one here. You're getting the idea that these blooms were first uh, discovered in the high latitude regions. Um, and this paper right here, phytoplankton in the Oslo floor, fjord, Coccolithus huxleyi summer. The species used to be called Coccolithus, and then it was changed to Emiliania after the great uh, geologist Cesare Emiliani. And... And there's this one from 1962. So we've been looking at blooms of coccolithophores for quite some time. <clears throat> and here's just the, the 1952 paper. And there's some things to note in this one on the discoloration. Um, things, he said, in June 55, a conspicuous discoloration of the coastal waters in the fjord systems re was reported. Um, according to the report, seawater had uh, acquired an unusual milky green color, condition noticed both by fishermen and other inhabitants of the area. Uh, previous surface samples were sent to the Institute, and they identified them as Coccolithus huxleyi. The phenomenon was evidently caused by this organism, which is recorded in numbers of uh, up to 115 million cells per liter, uh, the situation being similar to that reported by Browood and those pubs that I just told you about. So what is a bloom of coccolithophores? Uh, the first uh, satellite observed bloom was by Holligan in 1983, and he found a, concert, a concentration of 8,500 cells per mil, and with their, their scales, their individual coccoliths, the concentration of 78,000 per mil. Um, but the important thing here, we call these a bloom, a phytoplankton bloom, which Typically, when you hear about a dinoflagellate bloom, for example, there'll be very high concentrations of the dinoflagellate pigment, or chlorophyll, or the accessory pigments. In this case, you can have a coccolithophore bloom with very turbid water, but with not very much chlorophyll in it. You can ha it can have a milligram per meter cubed, uh, yet there's all the scattering from the calcite. Uh, and but even so, without that pigment, it still represents a significant discoloration. So here is the paper that Holligan et al. published. And uh, this is a Nature publication. And, and this is in the days of CZCS. And uh, I hope you guys appreciate the ocean color that you have now. Uh, this was what the image uh, that they published in 1979 looked like. There's this frontal boundary out here is called the Ushant front. And look at these very high reflectance features. They didn't, really weren't sure what they were looking at before they went out. And they went out and they filtered the water. And this is what they found. Uh, and here was a fecal pellet from a copepod, which was just packed with calcium carbonate coccolis from the feature. So <clears throat> these, uh, these organisms are very important to the biological pump. And I, I don't know if, the, you probably haven't spent too much time talking about the biological pump, but basically how carbon gets uh, uh, fixed in the surface ocean by phytoplankton, CO2 goes into organic matter, the cells die or are grazed, they sink down to the seafloor, thereby pumping this carbon down to the seafloor where it gets buried in the sediments. 
uh, and sometimes uh, it'll get buried for geological time. Most of the time, that organic matter will decay, it will rot as the particles sink down, and it'll get recycled back to CO2. So that's sort of a short circuit of the biological pump. But carbonate flux is really important to the efficiency of how organic matter sinks to the seafloor because it's dense, it's heavy. And these are data from Roger Francois from a beautiful paper back in 2002 where he looked at the flux of calcium carbonate measured in sediment traps from all over the world, basically uh, globally, and he looked at the efficiency by which POC particulate organic carbon, makes it to the deep sea, and he found this relationship. And so just think of this axis as the efficiency by which it makes it. So the, the bigger the flux of calcium carbonate, the bigger the efficiency by which this material makes it down to the sea floor. So this is where acoccolithophores are really important uh, to the biological pump. They are. Uh, the sediment trap data or the, the distribution of... Yeah, so all of the, in, in this, the, this plot are sediment traps uh, that are from all over the globe, tropics to poles. So, um, so the, the biological pump has removed half of the anthropogenic CO2 that we humans have put into the atmosphere. That's why it's really important, amongst other reasons. There's another pump that almost nobody talks about, but it's a really important one that coccolithophores are involved in, and that's called the alkalinity pump. Now, alkalinity is based on uh, the negative charge in seawater, and one of the major components of that negative charge, from a chemist's point of view, is called bicarbonate, HCO3. I'll write that bigger so I can... Um, and... It's, can I erase this? Yes. Yeah. So in the chemistry of the sea, there are three components. There's carbonate, there's bicarbonate, and there's H2CO3. Those, th those three are all in equilibrium depending on the pH. Most of it is this, and the coccolithophores take this stuff up and they fix it into calcium carbonate. They take two molecules of bicarbonate and they'll make one molecule of calcium carbonate and one molecule of CO2. So when you're in a coccolithophore bloom, the CO2 concentration in that bloom actually goes up. It doesn't go down. And so you've now taken this bicarbonate, you've fixed it into these coccoliths, they grow, they die, and in the process of fixing the bicarbonate, here's a little plot of alkalinity here, where this is the amount, this is the depth. They decrease the alkalinity in the surface ocean because they're drawing this down. And then when they get down to this depth called the lysocline in the sea, they dissolve again, and they therefore increase the alkalinity in the seafloor. And people say, well, who cares? Uh, the buffering capacity of the ocean is dependent on the balance of alkalinity. Alkalinity is one of the more important components about how seawater buffers. So in issues of ocean acidification, uh, alkalinity is very important. So what they coccolithophores do is they transport alkalinity from the surface ocean down to the deep. It's just another chemical aspect of these organisms. They have this really strong uh, optical component. So uh, how much calcium carbonate is there on Earth? This is PIC, particularly inorganic carbon. Here's the total pool. Here's the dissolved organic carbon pool in the ocean. Here's the particulate organic pool in the ocean. And here's the atmospheric carbon. This is in gigatons of carbon. And basically you see that, that in terms of sediments, this calcium carbonate is a very large amount. In fact, it's the largest here. It's a quarter of all the marine sediments are calcium carbonate. Uh, and the biosphere has many calcifiers, corals are another one, uh, but this, the coccolithophores play a disproportionately large role. And this is what I just told you about the stoichiometry. They take up two bicarbonate, they take up a calcium here, they produce CO2, and then they produce calcium carbonate, which sinks, 
Sometimes that CO2 gets used in photosynthesis, sometimes it gets blown off to the atmosphere. So this is another important aspect of coccolithophores. Um, marine calcification is thought to be about 1 to 1.5. We're publishing a paper now where we think it's even higher than that, 1.8 gigatons per year, which uh, is actually, this is conservative, a fifth of the fossil fuel CO2 generation uh, equivalent to the CO2 production associated with deforestation and agricultural tilling of soil. So it, it plays a big role on the earth. Uh, typically in the ocean, uh, so PIC to POC, so P-I-C to P-O-C, typically about 5%. So it's a, it's, it's a small fraction, but more of that makes it to the sea floor than does organic matter. Most of the organic matter rots on the way down to the sea floor. Very little of it gets buried, maybe 1%, whereas uh, a sixth of all the calcium carbonate actually gets buried in the sediments. So you have this weird situation that when you get down at the surface, it's mostly photosynthesis in terms of the amount of organic matter, right? So the pickpock is, is 5%. But you get down to 2,000 meters in the ocean, and half of the carbon is PIC, and half of it is POC. Because that's all organisms. <laughs> Oh, all coccolis, uh, if just coccolis, it's, it's uh, a much higher fraction. Half of the coccolithophores can be. So, now that, yes, yeah. The number that you just gave for the CO2 yeah. and that process, is that usually included when people are talking about the strength of the oceanic CO2? Not always, yeah. No, it's a, it's, it, coccolithophores uh, sometimes get disregarded because they're a pain in the neck to measure, uh, honestly. And so people a lot of times don't want to talk about it or include them because it's, they have to be counted differently using scanning electron microscopy or birefringence microscopy. And, and so it's, it's one of those things that uh, they're not particularly popular to talk about because they're not easy to measure. Um, one of the coolest discoveries and this came out just last year in Nature Communications uh, regarding the biogeochemistry of coccolithophores. And this is by uh, uh, a guy named Durock and uh, Colin Brownlee, Allison Taylor, our co-authors on this, is that some coccolithophores require silicate in order to grow, the nutrient silicate. And you say, well, wait a minute, I thought diatoms only need silicate. And you're telling me that coccolithophores that make calcium carbonate that don't make silicate frustules uh, need silicate? Well, the answer is yes. Not all of the species do. And what they pointed out is that in 100 micromolar uh, silicate, they make pretty coccolis. And then for, for this one here, this is uh, coccolithus brudii. And then if you deprive them of silicate, the coccolis start looking weird. They start losing their symmetry. Um, and then if you add an inhibitor of silicification, you can make them look really weird. Okay, germanium looks just like silicate, uh, and so it's used as an inhibitor of silicification. Uh, and then if you put them in lots of silicate plus germanium, they come out with nice looking coccolis again. So why would I bother telling this to an optics class is because the integrity of the coccolis, the shape of the coccolis will change uh, as a function of silica in the water for some species. E. huxleyi is not amongst those. It does not have a silica requirement. So you could actually change the particle specific scattering uh, if you're changing the shape of these and making them weird looking. Yes? These are these are laboratory experiments. Um, I actually think they talk about that. I actually think they have. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. It's a it's um, so they show they have a couple of species here. This is Calcidiscus leptoporus. And there's Syracus fira here. And uh, but it's just it's really novel that you could have a silicate requirement for a coccolithophore. So that's a new result that just came out. Um, so the Gulf of Maine, we're here sitting beside it. 
uh, our first observations of these mesoscale coccolithophore blooms uh, came from some O&R work. I think Kurt was the program manager at the time, maybe, or it might have gone back to Spin Rick Spinrad. But we saw this high reflectance feature in the middle of the Gulf of Maine, and uh, we said, <laughs> what is this? We went to O&R and we said, would you guys give us just enough money to take a ship out there so we could see what it, what it is? And they did, and uh, we left at 6 in the evening, arrived out in the middle of the Gulf uh, in 6 o'clock in the morning, and the sun came up, and it was like we had run aground in Bimini. Um, and the Gulf of Maine used to have, used to have, uh, big blooms. Here's an example of one here. This is about 100,000 square kilometers, and this is our ship track. And, um, and that, that's me with, with more brown hair at the time, and I was wearing a navy blue. That was a navy blue uh, uh, jacket. And uh, you can see the color of the water. I mean, it was uh, just relative, even though it's an old picture and it's digitized, but knowing that that is navy blue, uh, you get the idea. And here's another picture. That's Steve Ackelson right there. And that's Patrick Holligan. And we're going berserk. And this is what it looked like when we filtered all that water. So just when we thought the blooms couldn't get any bigger, uh, we, at this point, CZCS was gone. It was dead. Uh, and we were using AVHRR. And uh, this is Iceland over here. Here's the entire North Atlantic. And we were looking at this feature and thinking, wow, this is, this is quite something. So we steered the ship uh, basically right across that eddy. Uh, and indeed, it was just chock full of coccolithophores. And the total area, this one was about half a million square kilometers. And um, here is Patrick Holligan, Jamaican. This is the late Chuck Trees. Chuck Trees was my color chip here. He had a navy blue jacket, uh, white and red stripes there, but it was the navy blue I wanted, just so you could see uh, the... the uh, uh, color, uh, the relative uh, color of the water. This is inside the feature, this is outside the bloom. And then while most of us uh, were looking down, others of us were looking up and we thought, wow, let's see if we could call this, this aircraft uh, and see if they could tell us what they see out the window. And it was a Lufthansa flight and uh, we managed to raise the, the pilot on the radio and we said, hey, would you, this is usually the part of the flight where they're falling asleep, taking a nap, you know, because nothing's happening and they're over the North Atlantic. And we said, would you mind looking out the window and tell us what you see? And uh, this gentleman in a very Germanic accent said, oh, just, just a moment. And he, he raised up his seat and said, ah, oh, this is amazing. I've never seen anything like this. And so he went, this is before 9-11, he went back into the cabin and he got somebody with a camera so they could come up and take a panorama of what he saw. And this is a slightly different scale of, of these eddies. We're down there somewhere. Um, but, he, you know, again, it was just this fantastic opportunity uh, where we could get a different uh, scale view of uh, one of these features. So, and then in the Gulf of Maine, blooms have begun in basically moderately stratified waters. Uh, we've seen them, this is a feature caught by MODIS. Here is, a, we have a time series we run across the Gulf of Maine called NATS. And uh, in this particular one, this is near uh, the summer solstice in June. And we found it forming around, this is more stratified region. It was uh, partially mixed here and then very mixed over here. And the coccolithophore blooms were basically forming in moderately stratified water. And if you look at where it formed, this is density space, here's day length. These are a whole pile of our observations, coccolith concentration. Basically, we see the coccolithophores are happiest uh, essentially near the longer day lengths, so we're near the summer solstice, uh, this is when we see blooms in the Gulf of Maine. Okay, let's talk a little bit about optical properties. Uh, I'm going to mention all of these, um, and 
Toby Tyrell in 1991 did a really nice publication on the impact of coccolithophores on the light field. And he basically compared uh, zero milligram per PI, uh, PIC per meter cube, so no calcium carbonate here, and 300 milligrams of uh, PIC per meter cubed over here. And he looked at the relative proportions of light of the 100% incident coming in, how much gets scattered uh, away, the total amount reflected, uh, and basically he was seeing uh, without coccolithophores, 0.4% scattered uh, upwards, 6.5% reflected, and then in the case of the coccolithophore bloom, 5% scattered upwards and 6.5% per uh, uh, reflected. That, do that doesn't seem, I thought the albedo would be higher than that. Uh, that it is, it is, but it's but the albedo of with 300 milligrams of PIC in the water would be about 30 percent or something like that. As, yeah, yeah. Um, absorption is about the same. Remember what I said about uh, low pigments. Uh, and here's absorption by chlorophyll: seven percent, seven point six percent, half a percent, four percent transmitted. Uh, to greater than 20 meters, so a lot more light going down outside of the bloom, and inside of the bloom, much less light is transmitted uh, below 20 meters. So he, he just was uh, trying to, to assemble the, the extreme uh, situations uh, in, related to a coccolithophore bloom. So the relative refractive index of PIC, particularly inorganic carbon, is 1.19. Uh, compare that to organic, particular organic carbon relative refractive index, and there's, there's variation amongst this number, but it's 1.05. Uh, compare that to biogenic silica, so opal uh, uh, test silicate uh, tests of diatoms, the relative refractive index there is 1.07. So PIC is obviously out there in the distribution of, of relative refractive index and is highly scattering. Dense ocean suspensions of coccolis can have a high albedo of about uh, 35%. Particularly inorganic carbon is birefringent. It rotates the plane of linearly polarized light by 90 degrees. And that's, we use that in order to count them, uh, to count coccolis, to identify coccolis. We use the birefringent light. That's a really handy property. Keep in mind, they are not the only birefringent particle in the sea. So there are other, and I'll show you examples of that. They have low absorbance. And the mass and the shape of the coccolis varies by species. Hence, the scattering cross-section is variable with values ranging from 1 to 8 meters square per mole of PIC. So this is a real problem for us in, in uh, satellite algorithms because uh, it, it's uh, e even the, the absorption cross-section for chlorophyll also has a range, but this is a very wide range. And uh, because it's species dependent, it's one of the sources of error in satellite algorithms for PIC. Coccolis can be a primary determinant, determinant of normalized water leaving radiance. In fact, you can plot chlorophyll versus NLW at 440, for example, and you think, well, there's probably a pretty good relationship. It's much better relationship if you plot NLWs against PIC on their own, not, not uh, ratios. So here's an example of that. Here is PIC concentration. These are data from the Gulf of Maine. And here's normalized water leaving radiance at different wave bands. So here's 412, 443, 490, 510, 555, and 683. And, and it's not, they're not great relationships, but there is a first order relationship, and they're, but they're significant. So for example, at 510 nanometers, where we see the highest uh, correlation between them, 42% of the variance can be explained in just the radiance, the single radiance, not a radiance ratio, by the amount of PIC in the water. 
and I'm just pointing out these other. So you can plot these uh, because coccoliths, concentration of coccoliths come in a wide, uh, very wide range of concentrations. You can plot these on log scales, which for, for phytoplankton generally uh, we deal with orders of magnitude variability. Here's normalized water leaving radiance, again all the same wavelengths uh, uh, shown on a semi-log plot and uh, the coccolith concentration, not just the PIC but the coccolith concentration, it's mostly Emiliani and Huxleyi shows this first order relationship. Here half of the variance at 510 nanometers is being accounted for in that relationship. So how about absorption? Uh, we did this, we were in the middle of a coccolithophore bloom and we did some uh, filter pad absorption measurements from the UV uh, above up to about 750 uh, for filters where we put, on, put the coccolithophores on and then we dissolved the calcium carbonate. And there essentially was no difference in them until we got into the UV and whether or not they're uh, are, well, there are organics associated with coccolis, but uh, those organics would have been present whether or not we had dissolved the coccolis or not. I don't think they would have been released uh, onto the filter, but that it's possible. So, so there is some deviation out here, but generally uh, the absorption uh, follows uh, with or without uh, the calcite present. There's size dependence of the scattering cross-section. So this is now the scattering cross-section uh, uh, B star. Notice the units, meter square per mole of PIC. And these were calculated, we used uh, this anomalous diffraction theory and using the relative refractive index of PIC, uh, the density and uh, the size, we basically calculated what that scatter, assuming that these were spheres, and here your uh, 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 foraminifera here, here's a pteropod, and so you plot size versus scattering cross-section, and you can see that the, the size of the coccolis, these things are one to two microns in diameter, is beautifully uh, centered uh, to make the maximum scattering per particle. Well, is this evolution? We don't know. Uh, whatever the purpose of these, and, I, and they're whole, that's a whole other lecture on the purpose of coccolis. But basically, this one micron size bin makes them enormously efficient scatterers as opposed to foraminiferin pteropods. So when people come up to me and say, well, geez, you know, they're foraminiferin in those waters, they could be scattering too. And I say, well, yes, indeed, but their scattering cross sections are quite small orders of magnitude lower. Uh, the volume scattering function flattens in the backwards direction in a coccolithophore bloom. This is a paper by Ken uh, and we're, we use this general angle scattering meter uh, suspended and we, we grew barrels of, of Emiliani Huxleyi, literally, and then we put this, uh, this instrument in there and basically what we were seeing was a flattening of the VSF in the backwards direction, which is really important uh, for predicting what their backscattering will do. And we were looking at different phases of growth and, and such, but the, the take home message here is that it's flat in the backwards direction. And, and if you look at the relative magnitude, this is backscattering cross section for plated cells, so cells that have coccolis around them, just as I've shown you in the, in the pictures, Naked cells, so we acidify it and we make them all go naked, air quotes, uh, or detached coccolis themselves with no cells present. You can see there are two orders of magnitude difference between the backscattering cross section of a plated cell and, a, and detached coccolis, and this is wavelength plotted here. So, so big differences, but what the coccolithophore does when it stops growing, at least Emiliani Huxleyi, the most abundant one, it reaches the end of its growth phase and then all of the coccolis fall off and one cell will give rise to 15 or 20 coccolis uh, conservatively or as many as 60 coccolis. So you have this multiplication factor of the number of particles in the water. So we might not see a bloom 
is obviously from space before they detach their coccolis. And then when they say, okay, it's time to go naked, they come off and suddenly the water turns this uh, turbid uh, turquoise color. Um, there's a little historical context. Uh, we've made some previous uh, uh, measurements of the backscattering cross-section for different species. Uh, and just like the absorptive cross-section, the backscattering cross-section shows natural variability. This is a paper from almost 20 years ago. Uh, if you look for different species here, these are cultures, these are field samples, the backscattering cross-section here, meter square per mole here, the average was about six, but we, it varied here from two up to 10. Uh, in the field, we saw a range of two to the highest was about 12 right there with an average of eight. Um, but if you look at just E. Huxleyi, which is the most abundant one, uh, those numbers are typically lower, and, and that's important for what we use in the algorithm. And as if this isn't complicated enough, E. Huxleyi comes just like all of us, come in various shapes and sizes. Uh, e. Huxleyi also comes, produces coccolis of different sizes. There are what are called type A, type BC, there's, a, there's one called type R, um, and they're seen in different parts of the world ocean, and they have different scattering cross-sections. Slightly different, not tremendously different. But BC coccolis uh, are, are, let's see, the, the type A's are a, a bit more fragile, they're not as dense, and the type BC's are a bit heavier. And I'm just going to skip over this. Uh, the, the, these differences could lead to differences in the backscattering cross-section. Here are some examples uh, from a cruise we, one of several we've done in the uh, Atlantic, they're called Atlantic Meridional Transit Cruises. The average BB star that we have seen is 2.2, and that's basically regressing the individual backscattering measurements with the individual measurements of PIC. I haven't told you how we measure PIC, uh, but you can ask the question later if you'd like. Uh, here's another cruise south of Iceland. Uh, and we come up with a BB star of 1.6, lower still than the AMT cruise. And uh, here's uh, another cro uh, uh, a BB, this is now, these are BB prime. I'll talk about this more, how we measure it later, but this is the backscattering due to calcium carbonate versus PIC, and here's a value of 1.5. So, Ways that we measure it, it's useful, and, and the optical ways that we use are useful over scales of meters to thousands of kilometers. Uh, birefringence, which I mentioned before, that's the rotation of, uh, uh, rotation of linear, uh, the vector uh, light uh, by 90 degrees. Acid labile backscattering, which is the scattering that decreases after you drop the the pH of the seawater below the point where calcium carbonate will dissolve. Uh, and then there are PIC algorithms that we use uh, from space. Uh, birefringence, which is the technique, just so you have it here, you can uh, get the, uh, it, it's a technique by, this guy Tierstein was a geologist, and Hayter was a student, uh, and it uses a substance called Canada balsam. Uh, which literally is the sap from balsam trees that they refine and they ultra filter. And then you can put this, you put the drop right on top of a filter, you put the cover slip on, and the can of balsam makes that filter transparent. You can look at it under a birefringence microscope, uh, a polarizing microscope. You don't see the filter, but you see the coccolis. Uh, this paper here by Gway Bishop uh, looks at in situ birefringence. Remember, I said the Coccoliths are not the only organisms in the sea that are birefringent. And it's a rapid birefringence method, and, it's, and they use it for uh, autonomous vehicles where they have let particles settle on it, and then they illuminate uh, the particles with polarized light, and then they have a polarizing filter that only lets the rotated light go through, and then they say that birefringence 
uh, is related to calcium carbonate. But, uh, and, and the example that they show in the paper, um, they have a petri dish that's got sodium chloride here, silica dioxide, so opal from uh, diatom uh, tests, and here's calcium carbonate, and they say look at it under cross-polarized light, and look, you can see that uh, calcium carbonate shows up, and uh, salts and, and uh, silicate uh, does not. But, and oh, and here are some examples of birefringence. Uh, uh, these are from different parts of the Atlantic, and you're looking at a, at a, a 400x magnification, and you see there are distinct patterns. This is a coccolith, this is a plated cell, and the patterns here, uh, uh, oil geologists use, when they're look, trying to find geological epochs, they use birefringence microscopy to find certain species of coccolithophorids to know what time period they're, they're looking at in their cores. Here's some others, here's 31 north, here's approaching the equator, and here's the southern hemisphere. But this is basically, we count these things uh, using this sort of technique. But beware, here's the limitation. This is a dinoflagellate under cross-polarized light. And they, uh, dinoflagellates have a theci um, that's made of sporopollenin, like what pollenin, pollen spores, uh, and for some reason, it's birefringent, and carapaces of zooplankton can also be very birefringent. So you, you can't just use the absolute amount of birefringence unless you're willing to have a certain amount of error. Now, if you can use image analysis to say, oh, this looks like the shape of a dinoflagellate, then you can disregard it. And that's the approach we've taken. Uh, birefringence can be on an unambiguously dealt with using image analysis. So here's a, a field showing some plated cells. Here's a plated cell. We're going to do a close-up in there. And our image analysis program finds the cells. It finds the individual coccolis. And now we're zooming in on just one plated cell with a couple of coccolis. And it then finds the peaks of light, uh, essentially, associated with the individual coccolis, takes their size, and so we can si not only uh, distinguish between cells and coccolis, we can do it in an automated way. I wear these glasses because I've been looking through a microscope all my career. And, uh, uh, but we can uh, separate the, the contribution from coccolis, and we can even come up with uh, sizing of them. And then we're going to zoom in, I think, the, the next slide, we're going to zoom in on that coccolis, and it, the program that we use basically finds the peaks of birefringent light. It measures the distance between these peaks. And so for each one of them, we can discern whether we're going to call it a coccolith or some sort of random calcium carbonate crunched coccolith. Sometimes there are only two points of light instead of four. And so we discriminate all of those sorts of things. Now, acid labile backscattering. Um, is the other thing, I, I just mentioned it, we drop the pH of seawater. We, we first, we have an acid pump and a flow stream. So we're, imagine yourself on the, your cruise yesterday, you're steaming along and you've got a pump where you're pumping water uh, past a detector where you're measuring backscattering. <clears throat> and then sequentially, every couple of minutes, you turn on an acid pump. And the pH of that seawater going by your detector will go down when you add this. It's a weak acid. Uh, and then you turn off the pump, and the pH goes back up. You turn on the pump, and so forth. And the backscattering signal looks like this. As you go through it, it's going up and down. And basically, you pick off the data from the peaks and the troughs. and you take the difference, you look at the differences between them. So this is, winds up being the total scattering as you steam along. And the acid labile scattering is then uh, this part in the middle where we've dropped the pH down below the, what's called the dissociation point for calcium carbonate. And 
and the coccolis disappear, and we measure the scattering again. And that, as it turns out, that difference is well correlated to the amount of PIC that's in the water. 532. You could, you could, I mean, you, you, you need to, you need to say what the wavelength is, but anywhere between 500 and 550. That, if you remember, that's where we saw the best relationship between normalized water leaving radiance and uh, um, the amount of cal PIC or the amount of coccolis in the water. So, uh, and that's away from, you know, think about the, 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 uh, the point at which there's less contribution of the pigments from phytoplankton. So you're, you're away from 440 to 490 where the accessory pigments are and you're more in, in the hinge point uh, for the spectrum, so where it's more scattered dominated. So here's an example of ship-based BB prime, so acid label backscattering, versus the ship measurements. And we use this device called inductively coupled plasma atomic absorption spectrometer, or now we're using one called ICP-OES, inductively coupled plasma optical emission spectrometer. And um, those are as good a measurement as you can make of the amount of PIC in the water. They're expensive, it's about $15, $18 per sample to measure PIC uh, analytically, but that's as good as they get. And you can see in the ocean, basically we reach a point so it's, these are very, very low concentrations. Uh, and these are, these are binned, and I'm showing error bars here. And then there's a point at which the concentration gets high enough that you start seeing an increasing trend between this acid labile backscatter and, and the PIC in the water. And wh why would there be this point? Well, there, this point where it goes from being flat to a climb is that there is other stuff in the seawater um, that can be affected by the acidification process. You might be blowing up cells and such. So we, we below these concentrations, um, this BB prime, this is an optical estimate of PIC, and it's, it's really useful that it's close to the absolute concentration. Um, but at these very low concentrations, the optical means of detecting calcite uh, isn't very good. You know, there are other things in that seawater that are causing error. But then once you get above this level, and, and this level here uh, is still pretty low. A bloom, would we'd, you'd start seeing, uh, if you were standing in a boat and looking at the water with uh, this amount of acid labile backscattering, you'd say, whoa, there's something in the water. There is, that I don't understand this. Uh, and when we, we work on the, the ferry, some of the ferries we've worked in on, uh, on over the last 20 years, they have entertainment. And uh, dancers, singers, dancers, they have floor shows. And um, we were sitting in the mess hall one day, and we were going through a feature like this, and we're all eating our, our food as fast as we can to get back down. And one of the, one of the uh, talent, as they call them, came through and said, wow, Look at the color of that water. And I figured if, if someone, an entertainer, can look out the window and comment on the color of the water, you know that there's a signal there. And uh, they nailed it. And, uh, but. So the lowest values, this is 5 times 10 to the minus 5 uh, moles per meter cubed, is what we can measure reliably uh, with the acid labile backscattering. And the, the optical technique here is basically down to, uh, good down to 5 times 10 to the minus 5 uh, per meter in terms of the backscattering. Okay, remote sensing. Uh, any questions? Just maybe a time, chance to stop and, yes? Yes, yep. And uh, there are a couple of papers. It's, there's some recent ones and there's some older ones. Um, uh, uh, we published some work back in the 90s where we set up cross-polarized light and we basically sorted individual coccolithophores. And that's how we did 
the uh, specific, uh, the, the uh, optical cross-section measurements from that 99 paper where we were looking at different species or field samples, we took a, a natural sample, we preserved it with buffered formalin, it has to be buffered so you don't let the pH get low, and then we sorted it with a flow cytometer, any birefringent particle, uh, and we sorted it, and, and then we looked at it under the microscope, and then we actually measured in bulk the BB. Uh, and it's been more recently uh, done, if I, I can't think of the name of that, he's a Chilean fellow. It's a nice paper, uh, past couple of years, I'll, I'll think of it. Um, yes? Um, uh, it's very different between the coccoliths and the coccolithophorids. So there's some early papers uh, from the 1970s. John Strickland uh, out at Scripps and others that were looking, uh, they were using uh, cultures and they, um, they were looking at the appearance of fluorescence into the window so they'd layer the cells on top in a fluorometer, and then they'd look for the appearance of the fluorescence as these cells sink by, and they came up with a, a, a first-order estimate of their sinking rate. And they came up with estimates of a meter per day for a coccolithophorid. So they're, they're dense. I mean, it, make, it makes sense. Uh, beware, they, coccolithophores, like E. Hux, put 60% of their carbon into lipids. So that as I think, as a means to stay up in the photic zone, it's kind of a bummer if you're a plant surrounded by rocks living in the middle of the ocean. Um, and, but the coccolis sink very slowly, a tenth of a meter per day. And that's, the, that's a paper that goes back to Seuss Honjo and Mike Roman back in the 70s, where they actually measured uh, these. So what it means is, when you see a bloom from space, so think about, all the cells, they s decide to blow off their coccolis. I've got a song about that, but I won't sing it for you now. Um, uh, they blow off their plates, and the cells then essentially stop sinking because all of this ballast is gone. The coccolis will remain on time scales, long time scales, because they're at a tenth of a meter per day. Think about how long it would take for that individual coccolis to sink to the sea floor, you know, three kilometers away. That's a lot of days, and uh, it's like 10 years. And so most of the calcium carbonate arrives to the sea floor by the, uh, via the bus, the zooplankton, fecal pellet, uh, fast-sinking uh, uh, fast fecal pellets. But, um, so, so it's an interesting, the, the fact that there's such a disparity in the sinking rate, it's because Stokes sinking for two micron particles, even at, at a density uh, of 2.2 grams per cc, it's very small particles, so they just don't sink very fast. The coccolith of four, or the coccolith, it, it may, if it gets grazed and goes through an acid gut, it might get, it might dissolve. Um, if you look at just the physical chemistry of dissolution, all the physical chemists say, oh, it all happens at the lysocline. My own personal take on that is baloney um, because organisms, there are aggregates that have bacteria that are consuming organic matter and they're dropping the pH within those aggregates, which is going to dissolve coccolis. There's zooplankton with acid guts. The residence time uh, as these is as this matter goes through the gut, um, it will dissolve. There are whole theories about the purpose of coccolithophores as, as not having anything to do with light, but as uh, cells surrounding themselves with Tums tablets, basically. So the coccolis dissolve. It's like a sacrificial uh, plate that you put as a cell you put around them, which allows the cell to pass through uh, and and makes the coccolis go away when you've neutralized excess stomach acid, just like Tums. So, other questions? Okay. Um, so, remote sensing, there are two uh, PIC algorithms, and, and we're in the process of, uh, we have a paper submitted for another one. 
Uh, but these are the two that are currently being used by NASA. There's a two-band algorithm, which is based on, on two bands for, for reflectance. Uh, and that's the reference right there. And then there's a three-band algorithm by Howard Gordon, uh, which is used for more turbid waters. Uh, and, and that's the reference for that there. And the two-band PIC algorithm is nothing but a lookup table. So you have radiance 440 and 550. And there are isoplasts here for chlorophyll. And there are more horizontal isoplasts for the amount of uh, PIC in the water, or if you assume that they're all E Huxleyi, you can equate that to the numbers of coccolas. And so essentially what uh, the, the algorithm, uh, NASA's algorithm is looking at this lookup table and just uh, deriving PIC that way. And it's assuming um, that the backs, the, this two-band algorithm, it's really, it's very simple, overly simple. And it assumes that the light scattering is either caused by chlorophyll-containing particles or PIC. If there are sediments in that water or other types of minerals, it won't work. And so for case two waters, you have to be very careful whether there's, there's a lot of other materials besides phytoplankton in there. So that algorithm really, people will say, oh yeah, I'm looking at the, Bal at the uh, Baltic and I'm seeing all sorts of high PIC, but we know there's no coccolithophores in, in the Baltic. Well, there's case two for other materials in the water, uh, dissolved and particulates. So uh, that's a word of warning. If you're using the PIC algorithm, uh, save it for case one waters. Uh, and that's the radiometric error of Fermotus. Uh, the predicted error of this is significant. You know, uh, there are errors, as I've told you, because of the backscattering cross-section variability uh, for coccolithophores. The three-band algorithm, which uses uh, bands here in the red and infrared, uh, near infrared, um, it is based on, it calculates R reflectance, and it makes an assumption about what uh, the absorption of water is here, and, and essentially it uses published values for that absorption, and it estimates uh, spectral backscattering uh, using this formulation here, where uh, this n is 1.35 based on empirical measurements. And it works best, as I said, in turbid waters. So here is an example of the same scene done with the two band and three band. And they look pretty similar, except you can see that the two band is saturating uh, in this region here, the very uh, 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 high amounts of calcite in the water. and it's not saturated in the three bands. So the way uh, the, the merged algorithm for NASA works is it gets up to a certain turbidity and it switches from the two band to the three band. So you'll hear people refer to the, the merged two band, three band algorithm. Um, what's the performance of that? Here are data. Uh, these are uh, matchups through uh, May of 2015 for Aqua. And the one to one line here is the dashed red line uh, and the statistical fit is a bit off of that. Uh, down here, we're in this region where the PIC concentration is low and the errors associated with other particles uh, can creep in. So you see that the, the, the variance uh, here is increasing as you get down to lower concentrations. It's just the fact that there is other stuff, even in, 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 oligotrophic, sesh, in oli oligotrophic regions where PIC is actually uh, fairly predominant relative to chlorophyll, there are a lot of other uh, types of particles uh, in the water. So the global views, <clears throat> there are some important caveats. As I've already said, the algorithm can be fooled by other scattering materials. So the error from scattering uh, sediments or diatom frustules in high abundance. Even though the relative refractive index of opal is 1.07, you can still have enough diatoms and their suspended frustules uh, in the water to cause uh, uh, um, a false reading. Uh, and the error, the estimated error that we've come up with, which it, uh, for a single